Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for watching. Today on Station Rigs, we're at Hazmat 2 in Lancaster County. So today we're meeting up with Rob Walker. How are you, sir? Nice to meet you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you for inviting us out. No problem. Glad to have when you. When I first got the invitation, I thought you guys had one truck. You guys got a whole station full of stuff. Oh, yeah. We've got a lot of stuff to show you today. All right. So I'm Rob Walker. I'm the Toxmedic Program Coordinator. I'm one of the paramedics here at Hazmat 2. Okay. Okay. And, uh, well, we've got a lot of stuff to show you and uh, a lot of ground to cover. So uh, we'll start right here with the Prime Mover. This is uh, the truck that we refer to as Hazmat 2.2 primarily responds to hydrocarbon spills. And the main duty of this truck is to pull the spill trailer behind us. Okay. And uh, a lot of people wonder like, what do you got in there? A little bit of everything. So let's take a, let's take a quick okay. look. And this is an F550 truck? It is, yeah. And this is uh, part, of the, uh, part of the deal that we have with the South Central Task Force is they supply this vehicle to us and to other hazmat teams across the Commonwealth and uh, we use it for a little bit of everything. It's a utility truck that hauls around tools. We have some uh, entry suits in here. This supports level B entry. Uh, lots of boots, lots of patch and plug stuff in this truck as okay. well. Okay, uh, but you needed the dually to pull this size trailer. This trailer is absolutely huge. Yeah, this thing is jam packed full of stuff. Um, and, and really we did need a bigger truck to pull this with. So the Prime Mover is a perfect perfect choice for that. Okay, what do you got inside? Well, let's take a look. Let's let's go through the trailer first because that's probably the more interesting thing. Everybody's like, what's inside this trailer? Uh, well, a little bit of everything. And we're kind of experts, like I mentioned before, at cramming 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag. So okay. when you take a look in our trailer, uh, the first thing you see is our gator. Right. And this gator uh, is one of those things that is invaluable when we're out on the highway and we've got a large hydrocarbon spill. Uh, one of the first times this gator was used with a drop spreader, um, we had a, a hydraulic fluid leak that was about a mile and a half long. We were able to load spill tackle into the back of the, the, the spreader and drive the gator down the road and lay spill tackle down. So uh, really lets us work smarter and faster. Right, right. So to let our viewers know, we have a whole array of, video, of viewers. We sure. have young ones and we have senior guys. Right. What is hydrocarbons? What, what are we worried about? What is considered a hazmat? So when we're talking about hydrocarbons, this is the stuff, this is the petroleum products that we're talking about. These are uh, anything from uh, an 18 wheeler that's got a punctured saddle tank and is leaking diesel fuel to a piece of farm equipment that's leaking hydraulic fluid on the road. Uh, anything like that where we need to, um, to mitigate that stuff before environmental protection comes out or the contractor comes out to clean it up. Um, that's where this truck is going to roll. Okay, okay. And this goes all over the county? Do you... Yep, absolutely. So this goes uh, all over Lancaster County, about uh, 960 square miles in the county. Uh, we uh, reach all the corners. We've got mutual aid agreements with uh, neighboring counties as well. So if they've got a large incident, uh, we have no problem with taking this, uh, taking this truck or any of the other apparatus to, uh, you know, to Lebanon or York or any of the other surrounding counties. Okay. You definitely have a good way of packing things in here. Now this has what on it as far as a gator? It, does it have safety equipment on it? Yep. Does it have? Yep. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, everything you would expect to see, uh, you know, in here, we've got uh, helmets and eye protection for the guys uh, that are riding. Obviously, they're going to be wearing PPE uh, radios in here. Emergency lights are on the gator uh, and, you know, just uh, an array of hand tools and that sort of thing. Okay. All right. And then in the back behind the gator, kind of hard to see, um, you might want to you might want to jump up in there and take a quick look. But we've got booms that we use for uh, for creating dikes okay. to, uh, you know, to stop the flow of some of those materials. We've got lots of spill tackle, the absorbent that we use, and, and that's all crammed in here. Um, this is only half of the trailer though, so we okay. gotta, we gotta go zip around to the other side. If we walk around to the front here, you'll see that we've got a compartment on the side here that's basically the plumbing shop. This is uh, patches and plugs, things to make holes, uh, things to plug holes, everything you can imagine here uh, to, to plug those holes and, and I leaks. Notice that your boots aren't the leather boots that we use in the fire department. You use rubber boots. We do, right? So we want uh, chemically impervious boots. These are a lot easier to decon. 
Um, and if they get really grungy, we don't feel bad about throwing away a pair of rubber boots as a pair to, you know, throwing away a pair of really nice boot, leather boots. Leather boots, yeah. right. <laughs> um, so this is the front half of this trailer. And if you come inside here, we've got Wow. Drums for days. Holy cow. Right. So, okay. so we overpack, uh, you know, leaking vessels. We'll put those in drums. Uh, we've got an electric pump here to pump off, uh, you know, petroleum products. So if we've got a leaking saddle tank, uh, we can ground and bond this and, and pump that off. Uh, compressor for running air tools. Uh, a, a good selection of Ryobi tools. We love these because they're, they're, they're robust and easily available. And if they break, Right, we don't feel like we're throwing away a five hundred dollar tool. Um, these are easy to replace. Right, at, at and home they Depot. function really well. I yeah. got a whole set of tools like that at home. You know, you go to local Lowe's and right. replace it, and you're good to go. Right. So we've got you know a bank of batteries, uh, and and we love these things. So we've <laughs> we've got a big collection of Ryobi tools uh, that we use for for this stuff. So, so one of the things I noticed about this, how long is this trailer? How, how long is this? Is this thirty? 26 feet. This is a 26 foot trailer. Yeah. And you got a very specifically stock trailer yeah. as far as balance. Yeah. So did it take you a while to figure out the balance to make sure it was right? So the interesting thing is um, everything in the department here has been a series of trial and error, right? We try it, eh, maybe that's not quite right. We'll repack it, we'll move things around. Um, this trailer was constructed especially for this task. So things were moved around a little bit, but most of it we've got balanced pretty well. Yeah, so it's easy to pull. Yeah, 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 I mean it's, well, pulling the trailer this size is never easy, uh, but it's it, it pulls better than my camper does. All right, yeah. very cool. So now let's go take a look at what's actually pulling this trailer. Sure, we'll take a look at 2.2, the prime mover. Um, inside this thing, again, it's designed to support the hydrocarbons trailer. So in the back here, lots of the other equipment that we would need to to get that job done. Wow. Uh, there's packs back here. We've got some extra suits, another generator, more radios, all the things that you know you need on one of these events um, that just doesn't fit in the trailer. Right, there's a lot of space. It's almost like the Redding toolbox. So this is a fiberglass box. It is. Uh, and it's got a lot of compartments on it. The, there, there are, there's a lot of room in here. Um, you know, we, we try to use every compartment effectively and efficiently and uh, other side we've got a complete resource library of hazardous materials resource books okay so you know most of it's computerized these days when the computers don't work the books still do you got to have the backups yeah exactly and behind this truck you have something else right yeah so behind this we've got uh two three which is an ambulance that's not an ambulance okay let's, let's go, go take, take a look, look at that All right, so this is Hazmat 2-3, and uh, we have to say uh, a very special thanks to the former uh, Lawn EMS in Lebanon who originally owned this ambulance. Okay. Now, this is an ambulance. It's not an ambulance. Right, right. right. You notice there's no litter in there. Yeah. We use it for an entirely different purpose. Want to climb in? It, absolutely. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah, so it's a great people mover. Ambulances are, uh, are perfect for... For hauling people around um, and contrary to popular belief we don't use the big tv for xbox <laughs> all right all right we use this as the video monitor for our drones wow okay why do you need drones in a hazmat area like how does that work great question so the drones do a lot of different things right they give us the ability to uh, get over uh, a scene and get a really good look at what's going on, right? If we've got a chemical leak or we've got a tanker overturned or whatever the case may be is, we can get a really good view of that from the air. Okay. We can also have a guy in a suit take a drone into a location and put it down and now we've got wireless cameras that we can use. Okay. We also use the drones for uh, assisting police departments with searches. Uh, we've helped fire departments uh, identify hot spots and structure fires. Uh, we've been involved in, you know, basically anything where you need an eye in the sky. We've got trained uh, Part 107 pilots okay. who are able to uh, get those drones out, deploy them quickly, and assist any agency that needs them. So this is actually the kind of the new age yellow canary. Remember you used to, yeah. they talk about sending them down into the Right, mine. canary in a coal mine. Yeah, yeah. So, right? you know, using a drone, you're sending that canary in, you're taking a look at what's going on. Right. You know, when we were in it, or when I started, you know, our canaries were our police officers. They'd right, go in, blue they'd, canaries. <laughs> they'd go in, they go down, and we, we'd right. have to go get right. them. Right, you follow the trail of bodies <laughs> exactly. to, the, right, to the hazardous materials. So incident. by using technology, that really eliminates a lot of those risks right. that, that 
you essentially would have, right. but you're also diversifying and not just doing about hazardous materials, you're helping out other services, the police departments and right. fire departments. Right, and, and it's one of those things where it makes sense in terms of resource deployment, right? We've got trained pilots, we've got guys uh, who, who specialize in this. We've got members of the hazmat team who don't put on suits and, and go down range and turn wrenches, right, to stop leaks. Right. They do nothing but fly our drones. Right. It's cool to see that you, you know, take an old, older unit and redesign it, reconfigure you, you it. You can call it old, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> that w but it, it works well. It, yeah. You know, there's plenty of room in here. We can get a couple guys. I got a good view of the screen mm -hmm. uh, to see what's going on. Right. It, it's thinking outside the box. It's coming right. up with those ideas that, you know, I don't have to have the newest, baddest control or uh, module to do this. I can do it with some of the older stuff and reconfigure it. Right, cost effective. Um, you know, we when we purchased this ambulance, um, it, it basically paid for itself after the first couple of calls. So um, really a, a multi-use unit. I mean, obviously it hauls around our drone equipment. We use it to resupply uh, some of the hazmat uh, equipment that we carry. There's booms on here, there's spill tackle on here. We carry, um, you know, entry suits and radios and meters and all the rest of that equipment as well. But it's great for rehab. Right. Okay. If we need to rehab a guy, we can crank up the air conditioning in here. He can take his suit off, relax in here, have a Gatorade. You know, we'll check his blood pressure, get him out of the weather. This is a perfect, perfect right. unit right. for that. We we'll go take a look at that big boy next to us. Oh yeah, Hazmat Two One. Let's go do it. All right. Now this was one of your original Hazmat. This was the original Hazmat unit for the team. Yeah. Okay. So Hazmat Two One is a 95 Simon duplex. Wow. And I don't uh, think they're even in existence no, anymore. No, they are gone. And uh, this truck is older than a lot of our members now. <laughs> okay. So uh, still gets out. This is the workhorse. Okay. And we'll it's kinda, a beautiful truck. It is a beautiful truck. And I, I mentioned earlier that we are the masters of cramming 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag, right? And okay. this this truck is a perfect example of that. Okay. So when, we, when the truck was originally built, it was specified uh, specifically as a hazmat, uh, as a hazmat response unit, and some of the way the cabinetry was designed was specific to the equipment that was available then. So we've had to be pretty ingenious at being able to um, reconstruct some of the internal workings of this thing, and I'll show you some of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even from the medic side of it, we've had you know medications that come in different vials sure. versus ampules versus that, and we've right. always got to kind of reconfigure it right. depending on our supplier and stuff like that. Yep. That's no different than a fire truck or even a hazmat truck that over the years you got new technology, you get new products that are going to be packaged differently. Right. So. And and the the nice thing about this truck is gives us the opportunity to repackage things. It's really a blank slate. We can take things out, put things in. Um, you know, a perfect example is the drone system. So originally this truck came with a big telescopic mast that would have a camera, we right. attach a weather station to that sort of thing. Um, like a command module. Right, exactly, right? You know, like a TV truck would have that big yeah, mast yeah, that would okay. go up and, and you get a good bird's eye view. So over the years, uh, the mast developed some issues and they said, well, why don't you guys replace the mast? Well, it was more cost effective to buy a drone than to replace the mast. Okay. So that's just a, a way that we've um, kind of reconstructed some of the things that are that are in this truck. Okay. So typical, uh, you know, typical apparatus here. Yep. Pull the shoreline. So, take a look in there. Looks like a typical fire truck. Right. And yeah. the the interesting thing is, you know, driving this is uh, something that some of the new members are not comfortable with at all. Right. <laughs> all right. You're right. right. If yeah. they drive, you know, a little Ford Focus, um, getting behind the wheel of this thing is. Um, can be intimidating. Nerve wracking. Right, yeah. right. So, so luckily we've got some members uh, who have been driving this thing since day one. Okay. And those guys uh, get out to our calls and, and get right in there and um, are, we're really comfortable with having them drive this big apparatus. Okay. So kind of put you on the spot a little bit. Sure. How many members do you have in the company? So it, it's, it's fluid, right? Just like every other volunteer company. So. Uh, we've got somewhere around 50 members. Okay. Um, there's about 25 of those guys that are extremely active. Okay. Um, but we see people uh, as they come and go. We've got some guys that are deployed in the military. 
Uh, we've got some folks that are in school that can't commit the time that they used to commit. And people come and go, uh, but we always have a really good solid And you're 100% volunteer. 100% volunteer, not a paid guy in the place. Okay. So how do you raise finance for all this kind of stuff? How do you, what's the kind of different resources you use? So that's a really interesting question. And a lot of people don't understand how Hazmat gets, um, gets reimbursed. So uh, in most cases, in, in many of the larger industrial type incidents that we respond on, we bill the spiller. Okay. So if you, um, you know, have Bill's chemical company and you release a large spill that we have to respond to, um, we bill you okay. for the services, uh, for the equipment and consumables that we use, and that pays for some of it. Um, we get some funding um, through the Commonwealth. We get some funding uh, through the county. We fundraise. Uh, okay. Lots of different ways to get to get reimbursed okay. for this. So if our viewers are out there and they want to be able to donate, yeah. they can go to your website and sure. donate. Sure. What, what would be a website that hazmat2.com? Okay. Yep. And we're actually, uh, interestingly enough, we're putting a store up there. So if you're a Challenge Coin guy and you want a Challenge Coin or you want to buy one of our patches, uh, we'll put that stuff up there and make it available. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. you guys watch it, check it out. Yeah. We'll buy put a, a patch. Link. We'll put a link below and we'll get you some stuff. <laughs> cool. What do you got in the cabinets? So so the cabinets uh, are full of all of the tip stuff that you would see in a hazmat unit. This truck was designed to be able to get every piece of equipment we need uh, on a hazmat call to meet the requirements of Act 165 um, with one unit. So we have to be able to be on scene within two hours okay. of, of a hazmat incident and we can do it all with this unit. So, so this is an all-in-one truck. Yeah, so it, yeah. It, Essentially the trailer that we looked at earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the the other drone unit you essentially could have all in this one in this one we unit. could right so we what we like to do is um if we don't need to bring hazmat 2-1 out to an incident we won't we'll okay. leave we'll leave this one here um if we've got a simple hydrocarbon spill we'll take um you know we'll take the spill trailer if we've got a call where we just need the drone we'll take two three with the drone team um if we've got a call where we just need a medic we'll take the medic unit and we'll get to that one coming up too. all right um but in here this is the big stuff Th these are the things if you were going on a on a hazardous materials incident this is the stuff you would expect to see Right, so this has got our chlorine kits in here, and yeah, and, and you've been a firefighter for ages, yeah. right? So you've probably seen chlorine kits get used. These guys um, have uh, have been standards in you know hazmat tech classes forever, right? You've got to got to uh, stop that leak in that chlorine one ton container. Yep. yep. All right, so so that stuff is in here, and these are the things that we don't use all that often, but when you need them. Right. You need them. It's there for licensure. You make sure you got all this stuff. But right. like you said, when it's there, you you can't go back to another vehicle. You can't call somebody else. Right. You have to be ready to go. Right. This is like we, if you were doing a home improvement project, you know, uh, and, and you're like, oh, I don't have the right tool. You run down to Lowe's, right? When we're at a, at a hazmat incident, if we don't have the right tool, we don't have the time to run to Lowe's. We run out to the truck and chances are, we've got the tool on the truck. That's again. awesome. That's yeah, awesome so so it's a big, uh, it's got that release on the bottom, just press up on that thing yep. and you can you can slide it right back in. I feel it here. Maybe up, it's like a flat plate. There it is. There you go. More tools. Okay. This uh, this cabinet is is kind of interesting. This is where we have our uh, our decon corridor. So if you've, if you've seen, um, a hazmat team set up a decon corridor before, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Kiddie pools yeah, and yeah. the showers and yeah. all that stuff. Normally takes a team half an hour, 40 minutes to set that up, right? Because it's involved, they right. got a lot of equipment. Right. We have basically packed the entire decon corridor into one rolling box, and we can have one person set up a decon corridor for wet decontamination in less than 10 minutes. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. And this is one of those things we drill on, right? So right. when a new member comes in, um, one of the requirements are, you know, just like you need to be able to get your, your, your gear on in 90 seconds. You need to be able to be packed up. Right. You need to be able to set up the decon corridor by yourself. Okay. okay. So that's one of the This one is of the one of the ones. cool things, because years ago I took a class with uh, Contoms down in, sure. in uh, Bethesda, and they teach us about hazmat materials because right. as a SWAT officer or a SWAT medic, we may go into a meth lab that needs to be decontaminated. Right. And this is exactly what we did, Right. Uh, but it took us almost a day to set it up and get it organized. Nice. Right. You guys can do it in 10 minutes? Yeah, we can, and, and one person wow. can do it in 10 minutes, right? Can pull this thing out. Everything you need is in this container. And, and this comes from a lot of time 
in experimentation and figuring things out. What's the best way to do it? And how can we make this smaller? How can we make this more compact? How do we make it easier for the crews to be able to get this stuff out? And that's a perfect example of that. Very cool. And yeah, and you're gonna see lots of those things here okay. as, we, as we roll through. So if we pop up this cabinet here, uh, drums for days, right? <laughs> yeah. So we've got lab packs here for overpacking material. Um, we've got, uh, you know, just regular hand tools. We've got some canopies here that we set up to get the guys out of the weather. Right, right. We've got uh, litters. We've got a sked. Uh, we've got some level A suits up here and we'll pop around to the other side and I'll kind of show you how our suit up stuff works, which okay. is also a little different, right? Very different than putting on just a regular set of structural turnout gear. Right. Now, how many people can this carry, give or take? Uh, four or five. Okay. Yeah, it's not exactly the, the best people mover. Um, it's more once you get it there, it's the toolbox, the toolbox. and the command post. Okay. Right? okay. So uh, generators, some litters. Um, these are folding beach carts. Okay. Right. If you've ever been to the beach, like you go to Rehoboth, yeah, right? And yeah. You take all your stuff down so you can surf fish. Yeah. Um, these folding carts. And these are the old military uh, right? type, uh, litters. type litters. Yep. Yeah. So we've got these folding litters. We've got these beach carts. We can throw everything in there, and the guys in the suits can drag these things down range so they don't have to carry handfuls of tools. Okay. Right. Again, it's all about working smarter and and faster. Okay. So if we uh, come around the back of the truck here, uh, obviously we've got some American Pride. Yeah. Uh, in the roll-up compartment, uh, not a lot in there except some drums, a step ladder, that sort of thing. This goes up to the roof where the boom would be. Uh, yep, with, so the mast was up on the roof and we've got some coffin containers up there. Okay. Uh, we've got some, some older suits that are sealed in weather-tight bags. We've got more spill tackle, more booms, lots of right. stuff. And lighting. There. And lighting, exactly. Uh, let's take a look here real quick, open this guy up. Um, again, right, more tools. You, it seems like we can never have enough toolboxes. Uh, everything you would need is in here. We've got some, uh, some decon tents, we've got some uh, heaters, a uh, set of non-spark tools up there. So how long does it take you to get certified or understand where all this stuff is? Uh, it seems like there's so much equipment. <laughs> I still don't know where everything is. <laughs> well, you know what? It, uh, so when you um, when you become a member here, the probationary period, you've got a task book just like everywhere else. You need to be able to uh, pull things off the truck. You right. need to be able to find things. and, and Like the left-hander spanner wrench. Exactly, right? <laughs> the right-handed smoke shifter. Exactly. Right? Hey, go get me a fallopian tube. Exactly. Right? So we, <laughs> we know where all that stuff is. Okay. Um, Suits. So uh, my daughter is eight, and she loves to say that's the truck full of boots and suits. Okay. And, and that's really what a lot of the stuff that we have uh, is in here. So uh, level A suits are here. Um, we're not going to put a level A suit on today unless you want to try one on. Um, so what is a level A suit? So for those that don't know. Level A suit is the highest level of protection for uh, chemicals. They're vapor proof. That's the, that's the typical hazmat suit, right? Okay. You see the guy who looks like he should be in that uh, Among Us game? Right, right. right with right. the right, fully encapsulated air pack inside. Okay. Right, and you're your own closed environment. Okay. Level A suit. How many different levels are there? So we carry and, and we operate in three different levels, right? So level A, level B, level C is a kind of our, our work uniform. Okay. Um, when hazmat really first started to become a thing, everybody was like, oh, you need to be in fully encapsulated level A suits all the time. And we realized that that's um, at a big expense and it's not entirely necessary. So we wear uh, some specially modified suits and we'll, we'll show you one. Um, we wear uh, a suit called a Duracam 200 as kind of our normal um, duty wear suit, right? And okay. it's, a, it's a level B suit. It looks like a set of light uh, turnout gear, but it's specially constructed to be um, uh, chemically resistant and it's got some arc protection, some fire protection. Um, they are very unique suits and I don't think there's very many agencies that are using these. Okay. Um, so Ben Herskowitz, our chief, got together uh, with, who makes that? Kapler, right? Kapler, Kapler makes those suits. Yeah, so, so got together with the guys from Kapler and said, hey, uh, we like these suits, but we would love it if you could make some changes. And they said, yeah, we can make some changes to these things. So we have very customized suits that okay. I'll, I'll show yeah, you. Yeah, we'll take a quick look at those too. And the one of the last pieces here uh, is, is the rest of 
uh, kind of our suit up area. And we have a computer monitor up here for a very particular reason. We like to do things very systematically. So when there's a hazardous materials incident going on, there's a lot of things happening at once, right? right? So we may have somebody who's uh, doing what we call tech info, who's researching the chemicals, right? To figure out exactly what the hazard is. We may have a team here who's getting ready to go in, an entry team, right? We've got a backup team who's getting ready to go in and get the entry team out of something untoward happens. Kind of like a writ. Right, exactly. Yeah. The, the, the version of, of hazmat writ is the backup team. Okay. Um, and then we have uh, medical monitoring going on. So um, like rehab with the fire department, okay. um, medical monitoring is a really important part of what happens on a hazmat response. So not only do you get monitored when you come out, you get monitored before you go in. Okay. Okay, so we have all of these things happening at once and the computer monitor uh, acts as a status board. So shows where we are with medical monitoring, shows where we are with tech info, shows where we are with the suit up guys and kind of provides a stoplight. Okay. So if tech info doesn't have the information yet, the guys can't put their suits on. Okay. So it, it acts as kind of a scoreboard to show where right. we are right. in the process. Almost like the, the PAR that the fire commander uses. You know, they're gonna stop, they're gonna give their, their tag to the chief, they're right. gonna register them where they're going, and that's all done here electronically. Absolutely, we do all of that electronically. We scan barcodes, we do the whole thing to, to kind of keep track of everybody. Um, it's a lot more involved once you put on a suit and you start to go down range than it is to just grab somebody who's you know wearing structural turnout gear you can pull that guy out and you can go hey get out of there we've got somebody who's in a suit it's a long process to get them suited it's a walk to the scene they're on air the entire time they have to have enough air to get back out and then they have to get deconned okay so it's a long process we make sure that um, that our guys are monitored the entire time that they're wow. that they're in. A I had no idea it was that involved. In oh that yeah, kind of stuff, yeah. But. And of course, got to have a fridge, right? Because right. right. you know that's, that's <laughs> where we keep the Jägermeister cold. <laughs> this one first. Yep, that one first. Typical, right? More boots. More rubber boots. Yeah. Air packs. Yeah. Um, we've got a system set up where when we when we um, suit up our guys. It's not like we just start grabbing stuff out. It's very, very systematic. So we have a tarp that goes down on the ground um, that's marked out with every piece of equipment that the crew member needs. Okay. So um, a suit up kit and um, a perfect example, uh, air packs are here, suit up kits are next door. Okay. Um, a perfect example is everything you would need in the suit up kit is in there, right? So uh, multiple size gloves, multiple size suits. Um, uh, helmet, um, er everything else you would need, right? We would grab flashlights and radios, um, air packs, all of that stuff all gets laid out on the tarp. So when you're getting dressed out to, to go down range, everything you need is there and accounted for. Wow. So years ago, as we continue to go in, we had 9-11 happen. Sure. Unfortunately, shortly after that, we had a lot of these um, um, anthrax, anthrax threats. Yeah, white powder calls. That were white powder. And what I saw the guys coming out and doing, because we would always call hazmat out for sure. those, uh, they had one guy that was the technician. He would mm -hmm. basically sit down on a bench and everybody else would take these packs and they'd kind of get him dressed. Right. And that's what you're talking about, is right. they're getting his vital signs, they're getting the suits out, and, yeah. and he's getting ready and he's trying to relax as much as possible because his no, his job is to go down range. Right, right. And it's, and it's hot. Imagine that you know, you know how hot it is putting on structural turnout gear right. Right, in the middle of the summertime. Imagine now you're wearing regular clothing. We try to get them stripped down as much as we can, right? We put them in a hazmat suit. They got a pack on. They are sealed up, zipped up in this thing. Um, it's not uncommon for somebody who's wearing a level A suit to lose, you know, 10 or 15 pounds um, when they go down range. Right. So we very closely monitor you know, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, the amount of fluid that they're taking in. Um, we weigh them before they go. We weigh them when they come back. It's 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 important and involved, and right. it's a big part of why we decided to put a paramedic unit in place. Okay, uh, was to handle that medical monitoring, and we could talk a little bit about okay. that. Okay, let's get take a look there. inside here, and then yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that medic unit in just a minute. Cool. So this is the uh, this is the command post, and I think we have to plug that shoreline back in so we get okay. some power. All right, we can do that in just a yep. second. All right, so let's come on up here into the command post in Hazmat 2.1. It's a little tight, um, but this is where the tech info happens. 
So when we go on a hazardous materials incident, um, we often don't know what we're getting ourselves into, right? And, and we have some algorithms that we follow to kind of get us through the, um, through the unknowns. And a lot of that is computerized now. So uh -huh. we're able to use software to kind of help us determine what the chemical is, what the risk is, what level of PPE our, um, our providers need to be in, um, what we can expect from exposures, that sort of thing, what the antidotes are. Okay. All that stuff is computerized. And we've normally got a, an incident commander. Um, we've got a, a tech info person here looking that stuff up, passing that information onto the team. But as I mentioned before, computers don't always work. Right. So we still have an in-depth library of material to get us the information we okay. need. Okay. So okay. not only do you have to know how the software works, you have to know how Right, the library works. right. So us as a, the EMS and fire, we have our orange, uh, you know, DOT certified right, you got that thing. ERG. We, you know, we real quick reference guide. Right. But you guys are the in depth and understand sure. exactly what we're looking for. We we when we go through that, it's real quick. Yeah. You know, what's the evacuation zone? What risks they need to have? And you usually like, take them to the hospital. Right. And you know what the chemical is, and right. it pretty much stops there. You guys then say, how do we treat that? How do we fix that? Yeah. So for us, the the things that we're more concerned about are. It, it's not often that you have just one chemical, right? If you've got a tanker pulling, uh, or a, a truck that's got multiple drums in it, or you know they're, they've got boxes full of different things in there, we're concerned about how those chemicals are gonna interact. Uh, we wanna know what's gonna happen when they get hot. We wanna know what's gonna happen if there's fire impinging on those boxes. We wanna know uh, at what temperature uh, they may polymerize. We want to know all of that stuff. And, and all of that's available in the software. And we can take all of that information and we kind of build it together into a worksheet that helps us to um, be able to effectively answer those questions. But again, you, you can do all that with the books, right? If you've got the NIOSH pocket guide, you can use that to get some of that information right. and then you may need to get into wiser or you may need to get into you know tox in a box or one of those other pieces of software that you have and and get that information we're able to um, use some specialized software that we have to basically pull all of that stuff together and it forms into one worksheet we can we can look at multiple chemicals combined and see what the risks are and that sort of thing. Right. Do you also have um, phone communications and stuff like that? So maybe the engineer that designed the truck that's hauling it may have a specific thing, but it may not be in the hazardous section. Yeah. So we've we've actually got something better than that that we've started to do here uh, over the last few years. So um, we use um, we use Zoom. Okay. Right. And and uh, we use uh, different other uh, internet communication protocols to be able to. Uh, send somebody downrange with a camera um, and they can actually look at what they're seeing. We can conference in the person who maybe works at the chemical plant, the engineer who designed the system of valves that they need to look at, and the person who's inside in a suit can hold up the camera and say, which one of these valves do I need to turn off? Right. right? And the engineer who may be in Indianapolis or Munich or wherever can look and see what the guy who's downrange is seeing right now and say, hey, turn that big green one or don't turn that yellow one, right? <laughs> right. But, but we're able to um, use the technology to really get a good look at, what, at what's happening inside. And that's, that's new. Um, right. You know, again, right, the drones uh, kind of started that for us where we could bring a drone in, set a drone down, and, and have a wireless camera. Now we can have two-way communication that's video with the crew that's inside. That's awesome. That's yeah, awesome really makes a, makes a big difference. Um, so the rest of the stuff that we have in here, obviously um, we've got communications for in the suits. Yeah. So uh, this is a spread spectrum communication system. Um, the guy wears a, wears a little headset and has a throat mic. Okay. Don't have to mess with, with walkie talkies, right? You know, I mean, we've obviously got some radios over here right. um, that we still use, but these are a different type of communication um, that is designed to be worn in a suit. Okay. They all conference together, so the whole crew can talk together. They can talk to um, the guy who's uh, who's running tech info. They can talk to the um, uh, talk to the person who's the incident commander. And if we need to, we can connect these into the radio system, so they could talk to um, 
you know, the SWAT team guys. They could talk to, uh, you know, Department of Environmental Protection, whoever else we have on scene. All of that stuff connects here. That's awesome. Yeah, interoperability is really the key. Right. And, and communication has always been a challenge for yeah. any, whether you're fire, EMS, or hazmat communication is going to really what keeps you safe. Yeah, right. And and I think we all learned that lesson after 9/11 when you know nobody could talk to each other. We've gone through big, uh, big changes in the way we communicate. And you know having a phone that's got push to talk that's connected to the radio system, uh, the spread spectrum stuff, uh, it, just different ways we can communicate makes it a lot easier for us. All right. You have a medic unit off, so let's go take a look at that real quick. I do. Let's, let's go. go take a look. So this is the newest part of your service, right? Yeah, this is this is the medic unit. This is uh, this is medic 210, and it's a, a tox medic unit. Okay. So three big differences between this medic unit and and any other medic unit in in Lancaster County: um, the mission, the training, and the equipment. So the big difference is we don't respond on 911 calls. Okay. So paramedic that doesn't respond on 911 calls, what's that all about? Um, the entire duty and, and mission of this medic unit is designed to support the members of the HAZMAT team on a hazardous materials incident. So NFPA 473 kind of outlines the responsibilities and competencies of ALS uh, on a hazardous materials incident. And we recognize that it, it wasn't really practical to train every paramedic in Lancaster County and equip every paramedic in Lancaster County to respond to a hazardous materials incident and, and meet that standard. Okay. So, so we decided to bring that in house. So that's really the mission of the uh, medic It's a specialty medic unit, like yeah. the new tactical medic unit. Right, versus a exactly. And, and the way I, I explain it to people is if you've got a building collapse, Right, you call out the collapse team. Right. If you've got, you know, a SWAT call, you call out the SWAT team. If you've got a hazardous materials incident, you call out the hazmat medics. That's awesome. And, and that's what that's what this is all about. Um, the, now you have all the same equipment that a no standard medic should have. Absolutely. Yep. We have all of the all of the equipment that's required to be a licensed medic unit in in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Okay. So so all of those same drugs that a regular paramedic carries, we carry with some additions. Okay. Um, okay. the, the other part of this is the training's a little different. So um, the, there's a couple of training courses that paramedics take on top of uh, the regular paramedic curriculum, right? So you're a paramedic, you, yeah. you it's know. It's normally classified as other or operations kind of thing. Right, so, so in, in our case, uh, the courses that somebody would take to become uh, a tox medic would actually count as CPC. It's clinical patient care, okay. but it's very specialized. So if you've taken like a PHTLS course, right, yeah. or ACLS, right, same sort of thing. There's a course that's put on by uh, University of Arizona called AHLS, which is Advanced Hazmat Life Support. And that's kind of the introduction to uh, being a hazmat tox medic. Okay. And that's usually a two-day course taught by a toxicologist and a paramedic and usually another doc. And it explains the basics of, of tox medicine, like what you may see and how you treat it. Right. Because right now, all we get is atropine and do a dope. Right, exactly, right? <laughs> you know? and, and, and that's the deal. In a paramedic class, when they talk about hazardous materials, it's normally like one of the last chapters in the book, yeah, yeah. right? And they go like, listen, if you see a hazardous materials incident, just stay away from it. Yep, right? sludge and give atropine. Right, exactly. <laughs> give lots of atropine. Now, how much atropine do most paramedic units carry? Not enough. Not enough, Not right? Enough. You need lots of atropine. So, so that's one of the differences here as well. The, the other really good course for paramedics that want to do this stuff is offered at the National Fire Academy right down the road in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And if you've ever been there, you know that the, these are some of the finest instructors in the country that are teaching really high level stuff. So they offer a course called uh, Advanced Life Support for Hazardous Materials Incidents. You go and you live on the campus for 10 days and you learn basically college level chemistry and then you start to take all of that stuff apart and convert it into medicine. Wow. It is an, it's a phenomenal course. It sounds fun. 
Uh, if you like chemistry, yeah. it's fun. Uh, it was the, the first week of that course, right. uh, your, your head's ready to explode. Right, right. And then once you start to get into the medicine, boy, it really all starts to make sense. Okay. And you start to look at things a lot differently um, when you start to look at toxidromes. And toxidromes are the series of signs and symptoms that lead you down the road to determine what the chemical is, right? right? So, right. Um, and, and you mentioned sludge, right? right? So when we see somebody who's been exposed to organophosphates, all right, they're salivating, they're vomiting, they're peeing and pooping, and right, and uh, tears are running down their face, right? Every fluid that's inside is trying to get outside, and we know the treatment for that is atropine, right? Yeah. We need to dry them up. So that's just one of those toxidromes, and okay. there's about 12 that you have to learn inside and out. Right, it's almost like taking our differential diagnosis and actually pinpointing it towards what the actual cause is of yeah. what that toxin is. Yeah, exactly, and, and knowing um, you know what the right antidote is, how much of that antidote to give, when to give it, right? Because some of this stuff um, is very time dependent and you have to give it early. So when we talk about nerve agents, right? And we talk about uh, giving praladoxamine, um, that stuff needs to be given early, right? You can't wait until you're six hours into this to give, you know, that two PAM auto injector. You need to give that quickly because that cholinesterase, right, um, has to be uh, ha has to be counteracted quickly. Right, right. right. So the, these are the things that happen when you're doing the tox med stuff. Let's take a little quick inside. Sure. And I saw as we were uh, finishing up and coming out of the truck here, you got a duty officer that just pulled up. I did. I saw a duty officer buggy pull up too, so we'll get a quick look okay. at that one. Yeah. We're trying to keep it a little bit on time. We're getting towards that edge where, you know, people start dropping off, but yeah. we want to make sure we get the information out. So. Yeah. So, so really quickly, it's just like any other Chase Medic truck. That, that you would see, right? We've yeah. got all the typical stuff, uh, safe for narcotics. Uh, we've got a life pack monitor. We've got a BLS bag with oxygen, CPAP, and yeah. all that good stuff. And an ALS bag that's got all of our medications, uh, video laryngoscope, um, all that other good stuff. Okay. But you also have air cylinders. You have Right. We've got PPEs. the things. Yeah, we've got the things that, uh, that typically are not in a medic unit. We've got... Uh, We've got suits, right? So we've got a level B suit. Um, we've got an air pack. Um, you know, most paramedic units don't have the ability to have their medic pack up and get into the warm zone to be able to take care of a patient who might have been exposed. Right, we're always waiting for them to bring it out to us. Yeah, and, and our deal is we're ready um, and you know, ready to get in there and, and take care of that patient immediately. Again, it's probably gonna be one of our guys who's been exposed or may be in a suit had gone down range and suffered a medical incident. Okay. We want to be able to treat them quickly. Right. And right. that's that's right. really what the purpose of this and, was. And the front of this truck is just like a regular response vehicle. Yeah, yeah I mean, the lights and sirens. Lights and, and sirens and radios and, 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 yep, and all, all of that, that good stuff. stuff. Yep. Absolutely. Very, this is awesome to have. Yeah. I never really thought about it. You know, I, I do the tactical side of it. Sure. This would be a great tactical vehicle. Yeah. But it really is. It's but it's very specific for that hazardous material stuff. Right. And it, and it's one of those things where we consider it like flood insurance. Right. You know, hopefully you never need it. But when the water's rising and your stuff's floating away, you're sure glad you have it. Yeah. Right. right. And that's what this is all about. All right. Let's go take a real quick look at that other truck and uh, and we'll get you out of here. All right. Sounds good. All right, so we opened it all up so you can get a quick look at what's going on. I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to show you what our typical duty officer vehicle looks like. When we have a, a duty officer on duty 24-7 uh, that has one of these vehicles, we have two identical. Okay. And they carry everything you would need to run a small hazardous materials in. It's a mini hazmat truck. It absolutely is a mini hazmat truck, jam-packed full, right. specially designed for this mission, and um, the the guy who did this, um, Nate Hamill, is a master at upfitting. Okay, okay. So you got it's a pull-out drawer. You yep. got everything on there. So you got your PPEs. You got your camera. So it looks like you got a barrel for right for overpacking. Over, yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've got uh, spill pads. We've got uh, aggressive liquid pads. We've got booms. Uh, the whole shebang here. Uh, special tool boards on the side that hold, you know, shovels and grabbers and ropes and tarps, all of that good stuff. Um, the uh, other side has a, has a sort of uh, identical tool board. Um, in the front, we've got a regular full uh, console here, radiation detection meters, we've got metering, portable radios. So this actually is, um, this is the chief's buggy. Okay. He's, he's driving this one. Um, and our, our second is out with our duty officer right now. 
These guys respond first to every hazmat call. Um, if it's something beyond their scope, that's when they call the rest of the okay. team. Okay, and this is a Dodge 2500 yep. series. Um, it, you have a cap on the back, but yep. does, can this be module? Can this pull off? And Like if this one needs to be replaced in four or five years, whatever your replacement yep. plan is, Absolutely. this should be able to be pulled off and put on another truck, right? Exactly right. So the cap will come off, the slider will come out, it fits a standard bed. Um, and, you know, we were replacing some of the other squads and we were looking at different vehicles and Dodge came in um, just as a, as a great price point, and we were able to buy two for the price of one. Yeah, so it yeah. really makes a lot Beautiful of sense truck. for us. I love the black and orange too, uh, with the green emblem on it. It really stands out. You got some very nice features here. You know, I appreciate you guys inviting us out and taking a look. This Absolutely. is a lot more than we anticipated. Yeah. When, when, I, you know, when we booked it, we were thinking it was gonna be one truck. Right. But you guys have a whole service here. And I think it was very important for our viewers to see everything that you guys do. Yeah, And, yeah. and everything that you guys are about. And yeah. once again, this is a volunteer service. 100% volunteer. Now, if anybody in the area would like to volunteer, how do they get a hold of you? Hazmat2.com, our website's there. There's an application. Uh, you can reach out and contact us. We'd love to have people. We're always looking for paramedics. Okay. We're looking for people who uh, are interested in the hazardous material stuff. But interestingly enough, there's a job for everybody. If you're, if you're into weather, we want you. If you're into flying drones, we want you. So there's right. something here for everybody. All right, well, thank you very much thank for inviting you, us out. Once again, this is Heroes Next Door. This was the Station Rigs on multiple rigs today. Uh, we appreciate you guys watching. Do us a favor, hit that subscribe, hit that notification, and keep going to our website and get yourself some merch. Appreciate you watching. We'll see you next week.